everyone. Welcome to our today's session entitled Intermittent Fasting Safety and Effectiveness. We are glad to have with us today Dr. Muhammad Othman, Chief of Gastroenterology Section at Baylor St. Luke Medical Center. Dr. Othman is American Board Certified in Internal Medicine and Gastroenterology. So uh, we know that fasting is often associated with the season of Lent uh, for Christians and the season of Ramadan for Muslims. And it's primarily uh, partaken for spiritual purposes. But we know that fasting uh, has also a great effect on one's physical health. So this is what we are going to discuss today with Dr. Asman. Hello, Dr. Asman. How are you? Hello, Malan. Thank you so much for your invitation. And uh, I'm very excited. It's about time. Ramadan is in a few days. And I think yeah. there's no better time to talk about it than now. Yeah, true. Uh, this is uh, why we are having uh, today this uh, interview, to have more uh, information uh, for the public uh, about uh, fasting and, uh, and Ramadan. So uh, my first question, Dr. Othman, fasting on, or intermittent fasting, as it is known today, uh, is a weight uh, loss approach that has uh, gained uh, popularity lately, uh, a few years uh, back. So can you tell us what is uh, exactly intermittent fasting? Yeah, so... Uh... The intermittent fasting is, is a interval fasting. And what we mean by that is a cycle of not eating followed by cycle of eating. And um, intermittent fasting in the literature, uh, beyond the religious fasting uh, that's in Christianity, Islam, and other religion, is also available for things like long time. And people would do it medically to induce certain changes in the body. And the most common cycle of fasting is a uh, 16 hours fasting and eight hours eating. And um, we'll find that during the 16 hours of fasting, all the changes in the body will start to happen. And the eight hours of eating is when you start to replenish your body again. So we think about fasting as a way to reset your body. So imagine your cell phone is working, but it's not working as well. Then you restart mm -hmm. or your computer when you restart it. We can think about intermittent fasting as a way to reset our circadian rhythm in the body and restart the body again uh, so that you ha can have a good start. And knowing this fact is important because all the habits that you're gonna start doing when you are fasting, it's better be a good habit because you are resetting your system into a good start. So you don't wanna mix that with a lot of bad habits that will take all the advantage of what you did when you were fasting. Yeah. and. Um... Can intermittent fasting uh, help uh, with weight loss? Uh, and what is the difference between uh, fasting and dieting, the, the normal dieting, I mean? Myrna, this is an amazing question. And actually, it's a question that um, it's beyond uh, the philosophy of weight loss. And it's beyond a um, few days of the year. It should be a lifestyle. And yeah. when we say lifestyle, we mean by that, that we should always be conscious about what we're eating should always be choosing uh, good habits uh, in terms of eating and exercising. Um, is fasting by itself can help with weight loss? Which is a simple question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Uh, do we have an evidence about that? In fact, in 2020, there was a large systematic review by Kelly Toll. And this systematic review, they looked at 27 um, trials. And in these trials, they looked at intermittent fasting, either religious or non-religion. What happened to people who fast. And we find that they lose between 0.8 to 13% of their baseline weight without any serious adverse events, which is good. And then you ask me a very nice question. So what about dieting? We yeah. call dieting is calorie restriction. So mm -hmm. let's say you're eating all day, but you are restricting your diet. So what's the difference if you compare intermittent fasting versus calorie restriction and there are 12 studies looked at that and five of them found that they are equivalent, like actually they, they, no difference in terms of weight loss between calorie restriction and intermittent uh, fasting. However, intermittent fasting was associated with improvement of glycemic control in diabetic patients. What we mean by that, mm -hmm. they had a better control of their blood sugar. Uh, so basically intermittent fasting is as good as dieting but what happened after you stop fasting? People regain half of what they lost in two weeks. Wow. So, so let's focus on this again. You do all this good job, but in two weeks, you get this weight again. And why is this happening? Because all the habits you develop, you're already losing it. And mm -hmm. so 
when I think about fasting and weight loss, I don't like to link weight loss to fasting. fasting. Uh, the reason is the moment you stop fasting, you're going to gain this weight again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why weight loss and all of us are challenging, challenged with the problem of weight gain and how to help it. And one of the main thing is that it is a lifestyle change all the time. Mm-hmm. It's not a period of diet and then you're going to get better. It's not one month of Ramadan, I'm going to lose yeah. three, four kilograms. And then after that, I'm going to gain them again after Ramadan. Okay, so and uh, how does it affect the overall health? Yeah, uh, for example, uh, as aging, for example, because we know that uh, certain studies they show if you stop certain kind of foods like refined uh, sugar or protein, uh, it can uh, affect impact your lifespan. Is it true? Yeah, so actually there are good body of literature speaking about the effect of fasting on the cell and how it prevents aging and how it promotes the effect of the antioxidant. So basically, uh, people who continuously fast over time, they prevent cancer. Uh, we find that the markers that we call them the anti-inflammatory marker. So the process of aging, like when, how people age and get wrinkle and get fibrosis all over their body, it's an inflammatory markers that accumulate over time and affect our body. And it's so interesting. And we have one of our physicians here at Baylor, and I have to just give her credit, Dr. Wendy Goklu. I wish she would have been with us in the interview. And she did this beautiful study and healthy volunteers, not even sick people. And she did their inflammatory marker before starting fasting in Ramadan mm-hmm. and after fasting in Ramadan. And even in normal people who have no medical problem, their inflammatory marker lives and everything was going down, suggesting that Yes, there is over effect of, um, of, the, of fasting in general uh, on this parameter. There's one thing else I want to talk about this question and about the overall health. When you fast and you are not eating, you are developing status of what we call mindfulness. And this is a big problem, Myrna, that nowadays why people gain weight is because they're eating without thinking. So they will be watching TV and eating. Uh, talking to each other and eating, getting upset and mad and eating. So what happened? You're just not thinking. Fasting constantly remind you that you cannot eat, you cannot eat, you cannot eat. So the mm. moment you eat, you start thinking about it and you start thinking about what you're going to eat. So you should use that so that at the time when you come to the breakfast, you choose a very healthy choices and use your mind to choose what's the best for me and use it. So uh, mindfulness was also one of the most important benefit of fasting that is overlooked and people don't talk about it as much. And so you can, mindfulness also, you enjoy food more than you, you used to in general. Exactly, yes. So uh, doctor, can people with chronic diseases fast? Is it uh, safe for them to fast? Or is there any limitations for uh, chronic disease patients? All right, Myrna, your questions are amazing, but each one of them are harder than the previous one. <laughs> so I'll try to summarize this it depends, one. It depends on the, uh, the chronic disease, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the chronic disease, depends on the patient, but I want to give a slight guidelines because there are guidelines for that. So in general, we know that fasting improves certain condition, but there is certain things that could get worse if you fast, and if you have that, you should not fast. Okay. And we have to make that very clear. For example, people who have very un- bad uncontrolled diabetes, that they get hypoglycemic episodes. What I mean by that, their blood sugar goes so down, less than f- like 50 or less than a 70, and they can like uh, uh, fall unconscious. Okay. If you are taking insulin with large doses and your blood sugar is not controlled, then maybe it's not a good idea to fast. But if you insist in fasting, then you will have to have a good diet plan, have to have a good dietitian and good endocrinologist and measure your blood sugar constantly. Mm -hmm. People with severe kidney disease, that dehydration will cause problem. People who have renal stone, that he just had two renal stone removed, Ramadan is starting, you need to drink a lot of water to get the stone out. If you fast and you dehydrate yourself, it will become uh, a problem. Other than that, honestly, people with chronic disease, if you have a high blood pressure, if you have diabetes that's uh, um, controlled, you can fast and actually your disease will improve it was intermittent fasting, uh, but it's case by case. You have to consult your physician. Uh, but I'm just stressing hypoglycemia, I don't fast, kidney stone, mm-hmm. uh, severe kidney problem. It's not a good idea to fast. So in general, chronic disease patients should consult with their physicians to, uh, yes. before fasting or taking any 
drastic yeah. measure in dieting or something like that. Yes, and, yeah. and, and that's also depend on the time of the year, how long is the fast, like in the summer different than the winter. So that would be a very individualized plan. Okay, so doctor, can uh, fasting be a treatment to uh, obesity and overweight uh, in adults? Uh, and uh, can we do intermittent fasting as long-term uh, diet or no? It's not... Uh... There are studies about uh, intermittent fasting uh, for a few days a week, uh, alternate, one day fast, one day normal, one day fast and some will day, two days a, day, a week fasting and five days normal. And it shows overall the improvement of, um, of bio, biological marker. Yeah. I just caution about using fasting for weight loss alone. I feel like uh, the mindset about weight loss should be a lifestyle change for everything. If fasting will be part of this lifestyle change, that you walk at least half an hour every day, you eat a lot of green vegetables, you avoid eating high calorie food and food with dense with calories and high blood sugar, high sugar, that's fine. But if only you use fasting to lose weight and then the moment you stop fasting, you start eating too much and excessively, then now you are developing a bad habit too, mm -hmm. uh, which is not good, um, I think. Um, that's not a good idea to do mm -hmm. that. So we can use it as a long term, at, uh, as lifestyle, for example, if you choose like for every two weeks to do like two, three days of fasting, it's, it's fine. It is every totally day. fine and it is yeah. great. And if you do it the right way and you eat the balanced diet in the long term, uh, you will have much better uh, inflammatory marker than all the other people, less risk of diabetes, less risk of high blood pressure. Uh, but it has to be done along with balanced diet. And doctor, can children and teenager uh, fast? Yes, uh, children, it depends on the age. And like teenagers, they're almost like an adult, but children, I, I don't think fasting the whole day is a good idea for them. Mm -hmm. You may start training them, increasing the hours, uh, but I, I feel it is starting, so hard. Starting what age, you mean? Uh... Like, at, yes. like I, I think it's reasonable at uh, eight, at eight or nine, they may fast two, three hours later yeah. on, four hours, and maybe by age of 12 and 13, they may be able to fast uh, the whole day. Um, mm -hmm. But also we worry about children. We have to be careful with them. Fasting they are not able to run. And especially for religious reasons, they are not supposed to be fasting. You can train them like, but the religion doesn't say for Muslim and Christian, you fast if you are eight years old. Yes. Uh, you can give them an idea, maybe a good idea to tell them fast for three hours till sun, sun, um, uh, sunset. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but I wouldn't push them to fast all day uh, okay. because yeah, there's not enough data actually published about that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems. So, and uh, during fasting, uh, is, uh, does a, per a person new, uh, lose uh, uh, muscle? They, they, it causes uh, loss, uh, yes. muscle so loss, I mean, and it can, uh, can, they, can, um, they can have lack of energy also. And uh, what do you advise people to keep their energy uh, level high? Should they take yeah. vitamins, supplements, or? Uh, That's good. Should they do? So let's think about what are the side effects, like we're talking about the benefit of fasting, mm -hmm. but there must be other things that fasting can cause. And because also it is not natural not to eat all the time. One of the most common thing, and as a GI doctor, I want to talk about it, which is very, very important. And I'm going to get to the muscle loss, but before it's a dyspepsia. What is dyspepsia? It's that uncomfortable feeling in the stomach, this feeling of the heartburn. And a lot of people have this heartburn during fasting, especially the one who eats too much at the nighttime diet. And it's uh, suhoor in Ramadan, which is a diet you eat before breakfast or your breakfast before you start fasting, uh, or you call it the, the, the nighttime uh, meal. And, and in general, anyone who's doing intermittent fasting, you don't want your last meal to be too, too large. Because then you're going to start stimulating the acid secretion in the stomach. Mm -hmm. So now you have too much acid, but you cannot drink or eat. What, where the acid will go? It will just go up. It's not going to be dilated. You'll be going all day having heartburn. And I see this very common in my patient who are fasting. And I remind them it's so important that that diet, the suhoor diet, the diet you eat before you fast, it has not to be having heavy oils in it, not mm -hmm. too much spicy food. Uh, some people likes to 
eat meat, for example, for breakfast, it's not a good idea to eat heavy yeah. meal and then go, go to fast. So, so to that's avoid one of the, the acid reflux and the heartburn. Yeah. It should avoid the heartburns and acid reflux because when you stop eating for long, a long period of time, you will have it. Uh, this is uh, normal. That's normal, yeah. And, and some patients who already have problem bad reflux, mm -hmm. I advise them in Ramadan uh, to take um, one of the anti-acid medication uh, that's available in the market. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll go to the muscle loss. If you but don't I have, I have one more question about when you eat after a long time of fasting, uh, some people, they, uh, they, they feel uncomfortable. They, for example, they may uh, feel dizzy uh, because of eating. Is it... Uh, That's totally what true. Is, what is yeah. the cause of this? Yeah, so uh, we have a, a phenomena or syndrome in the body called the refeeding syndrome. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Now we are not eating. Now your stomach is shrink and a small amount. And all of a sudden, you put this large amount of food in the stomach. The stomach starts to get distended. And when it distends so much, it will start send signals um, to the brain that I'm distended too much all of a mm -hmm. sudden. Then the brain tells the stomach, oh, you better empty the stomach right away. So then all of a sudden, the stomach makes this strong contraction. You start having the pain and all the food all of a sudden would go to the small intestine with large amount of sugar. Your blood sugar that was very low, nice during the day, all of a sudden you have a very high spike in your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And this very high blood sugar spike makes you feel uncomfortable and also release too much insulin. And that high insulin that gets released all of a sudden will result in um, not only doubling your blood sugar, but a stimulation to the deposition of fat. So basically you are working against all what you did all day. Mm -hmm. So how, what we do, we should, when we start, maybe it's a good idea to drink some water and eat a little bit, small amount, then go do something else and then mm -hmm. have a meal after that. Almost like preparing your stomach to anticipate the meal. Now, eating in five minutes quickly in Ramadan, this is the worst idea yeah. ever. You don't want to do that. Actually, if you are one of the fast eater, and I'm one of them, you remind yourself in Ramadan, eat slower. Take your time so that your stomach does not distend all of a sudden. Okay. So uh, these are one of the safety measures uh, someone should take before uh, uh, during yeah. fasting. Is there anything else uh, that people should do also? A safety uh, measure? So I, I want to... Yeah, I want to talk about the relationship of Ramadan fatigue and muscle loss because mm -hmm. for a lot of people who are exercising every day, now Ramadan is coming, what I'm going to do? You know, I used to uh, run and then drink my coffee. You know, how I'm going to do this and among Ramadan. So you have three options. You can exercise after uh, fasting, which is a good one. You have another option to exercise right away after uh, at the beginning of the day, uh, which is okay. And I will tell you my favorite option, which is to exercise just before you break your fast and mm -hmm. which is the one hour before you break your fast and why is that because at that time right now you do not your blood sugar is at the lowest um, mm -hmm. if you are a healthy person i'm not talking about somebody who's liable to have low blood sugar if you're a healthy person and you exercise moderately around 30 minutes at that time your body will start using the fat mm -hmm. to create energy because there is no sugar left So yeah. our body uses the sugar right away to burn into it, to give you energy. But yeah. if you don't have enough blood sugar, it will turn into that fat that we have been storing for years and convert that fat into sugar so that you can exercise with it. If you do that trek in Ramadan and, and, and during fasting and you do 30 minutes of moderate exercise just before breakfast, so that the moment you finish exercise, now the moment you can eat, you can replenish your body with good nutrient like drink some uh, water, eat some green vegetables, and you do that 30 days, you're going to find that your muscle mass increase, actually not loss, because now you're going to lose all the fat and you're going to build the muscle. So what are the best uh, training you do in Ramadan? Resistant training. And what we mean by that? Like carrying weight, doing like the push-ups. That's an amazing exercise that if you do in Ramadan, it will maintain your muscle mass and it will tune your body very nicely. Uh, if you love running, I would say if you are a good runner, 5K, that's fine before breakfast, but don't go for 10K or something crazy, half a marathon when you are yeah. fasting and you will end up dehydrated or you end up unconscious. That's not, mm -hmm. so everything is within limitation. I would say moderate exercise, half an hour will maintain your muscle loss because mm -hmm. if you don't exercise 
and you don't do anything, yes, you're going to lose muscle and fat and carb, which is not a good idea. Um, and also the lack of energy part is part of it that we're not exercising. If you do that, few exercises during the day, uh, it would help. And what about supplements, doctor? The vitamins? Uh, yeah, so the vitamins... Healthy uh, person, uh, the, does he need uh, to have uh, to take supplements or no? Not I, you know, as a gastroenterologist, I say that if you're eating a well-balanced meal, you should have all the vitamins in your meal. Uh, but if you are taking medications such as antiacid, omeprazole, this medication decreases your acid secretion. It interferes with absorption of calcium and other vitamins. You can take it. If you have problem with your pancreas, you definitely need to take vitamins because your pancreas is helping absorbing vitamin A, D, and E. So, so but not for healthy people, I would say. You don't need to take vitamin in Ramadan if you're eating a good, well-balanced diet. Mm -hmm. And um, one last thing about the GI tract, because that's something I saw in my patient. Yeah. Um, bloating, and a bloating is a big problem for a lot of people. And, and some of my patients, they are perfectly healthy, but their only problem is that by the end of the day, they tell me, I look like, doctor, I look like I'm seven months pregnant. I don't like that. I exercise, I do everything. What can I do? The problem with bloating is happening because we have too much bacteria in our small intestine. Mm -hmm. And that bacteria lives with us. It's part of our genetic system. We call it the microbiome. Mm -hmm. But then something happened to this microbiome that we have a lot of bacterial overgrowth. We call it bacterial overgrowth. So anything you eat or drink, the bacteria will eat and drink it and then it start producing gas. And we figure out what even these gases are. This is a hydrogen and methane. And mm -hmm. we find that in some patients, this hydrogen can cause diarrhea, and in others, the methane can cause constipation. And then you end up with symptoms, what we call irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, or irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. So what is the solution for this? Actually, intermittent fasting, the 16-hour fasting, that there is no food is going down, it actually reduced the numbers of the bacteria. And I find a lot of my patients, their bloating significantly improved after Ramadan. And if you couple that by eating a probiotic like yogurt, and we do this commonly in Ramadan and fasting in our tradition, either Christian or Muslim would love to eat uh, yogurt in the Middle East. Yes. That type of food, which has very rich with lactobacillus, which is very good bacteria, it recultivates the good bacteria in your body, get rid of this excess bacteria that produce hydrogen and methane, and then that will help with the bloating problem too. So this additional so, benefit. Which other than yogurt, which uh, food uh, has uh, prebiotics in it uh, other than yogurt? So the probiotic is generally in milk, but also you can buy them in tablets. Okay. Um, uh, other foods- if Someone has milk, allergy for the- uh, For I'm, the milk, I'm just asking, they Because some, uh, yani, many people have uh, allergies uh, against milk or uh, yogurt or, uh, that's why. Yeah. So they can so take probiotic supplements. Yeah, there's tons of probiotic supplements in the market that could be used. And actually, there's also for lactose intolerant patient or patient who have milk allergy, there's other probiotic formulation in form of yogurt for them too. So okay. it should be available. And doctor, what about uh, pregnant uh, women? Are they allowed to fast uh, during uh, Ramadan? Yeah, uh, they are allowed to, but of course, under the careful follow up of their obstetrician and also depend on if this high risk pregnancy or not. If someone having preeclampsia or high blood pressure during pregnancy or high risk, I, I think it's not, um, it's not a good idea. If the pregnancy is going well, I don't think it would be a problem, but I would leave that also uh, to the physician and their patient to discuss it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about coronavirus? If, if someone is affected by the virus, and, but he has very, very mild uh, symptoms, for example, Yes. Is he allowed to uh, to fast uh, during the? Yeah. Period? So and so during the infection by itself, I you need to hydrate the patient. So if you are actively infection within ten days of infection, any infection in general, you better hydrate yourself very well. And with coronavirus or COVID nineteen, would say no. You have to 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 really dehydrate and be careful. But there is something new, Myrna, that we have been noticing in the United States: mm -hmm. the post COVID symptoms. Yeah. So people get COVID, they recover, and they come with all this symptom that's unexplained. And some of them is non-specific for me in my field in the GI, uh, non-specific abdominal pain, fatigue. The fatigue syndrome is one of the most common symptoms we're seeing. And um, I don't know the answer for that, but I have a feeling that 
maybe for this patient, the intermittent fasting and resetting your circadian rhythm and resetting your bacterial microbiome may help you improve because I have a feeling that may the coronavirus, it also affects the GI tract because it, mm -hmm. uh, it goes to a receptor called the, uh, the ACE2 receptor along the GI tract and they can cause enteritis and inflammation. I think they affect the balance of bacterial flora in our body. Uh, but again, that's what I think. I don't have data about that. So my feeling is um, a lot of these long-term symptoms could improve with exercise and testing, um, but we don't have enough data yet. Uh, and in the next few years, we'll know more about people who survived the COVID infection, mm -hmm. how they are doing. Um, but that's, uh, but we are still, we are noticing the fatigue already is one of the things that's coming up a non-specific IBS symptoms in patients with COVID. So, and one of the questions that comes out uh, from the public, can we get uh, the vaccine during uh, fasting, during Ramadan? Is it, uh, or any other medication? Uh, yes, you can get the vaccine uh, during uh, Ramadan. And most of these uh, vaccination is almost intramuscular, so it should not interfere with fasting. The question would be, what if I get a reaction? Yes. Because you could get reaction. Uh, and and I, I myself, in my second dose, I, I felt like uh, tired fatigue a little bit. Yeah. I had to get well hydrated. You if can you get have fever, that, you can have uh, You can have chill. fever. Yeah, which is, by, by the way, uh, people think about that as bad. That's not bad. Actually, this means that your body is working and training itself and getting ready to fight the infection. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in this situation, if you are developed any side effect of vaccine, it is okay not to fast and it's okay to take this day rest and hydration is a secret. You wanna be well hydrated in terms of you get infection. But in general, I think it will be tolerable during fasting and it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. So uh, doctor, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope we gave uh, people uh, some uh, useful information, especially uh, before the season of Ramadan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, I would like to tell you thank you for all this wonderful and amazing questions. I really enjoyed this interview. Yeah, and me too. Yeah, thanks. Take care. So uh, we'll see you. Hopefully, we'll see you again in another interview. And um, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye.